All right, well, I see a number of folks have joined us, and so I think we should get started. Hello, everybody, and welcome to our speaker series for spring 2024. My name is Tatiana Shippy, and I am the Associate Director for Research at the Center for Healthy Aging and Innovation, or CHAI, as we call it. CHAI envisions a community, state, tribal nation, country, and a world where every individual can achieve their life goals while aging. We do this through core work in education, research, policy, and equity and community engagement. Each year, we select topics that are of high interest to our members and community partners. And this year, we're focusing on transportation and aging. Transportation is a key social determinant of health. And as we know is of high importance to older adults as it promotes independence and social integration. We're doing this work in partnership with the Center on Transportation Studies here at the University of Minnesota and are grateful for their collaboration. Our main speaker today is Dr. Lisa D'Ambrosio, who will present her work for about 25 minutes. Her presentation will then be followed by a discussion by a panel of local experts here in Minnesota who are making a difference in their communities daily. Now, without further ado, let me introduce Dr. D'Ambrosio. Dr. Lisa D'Ambrosio is a research scientist at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology Age Lab, where she directs and participates in numerous different projects around understanding how to support people better in preparing for longer lives. Her work has included research around financial planning and preparedness caregiving, transportation and mobility, and technology use and adoption. Prior to coming to MIT, Dr. D'Ambrosio was a research analyst at the U.S. Department of Transportation, Volt National Transportation System Center. Lisa, thank you so much for being here. I'll hand it off to you. Tatiana, thank you. Um, I'm really excited to be here today and, and appreciate the opportunity to share a little bit about the Age Lab and some of the research that we do here. I am just going to share my screen and hope that this works. Always exciting when technology works like it's supposed to. Um, and here at MIT, we have lots of examples of technology not working when we expect it to. Um, but again, thank you so much for the opportunity to be here, talk a little bit about the Age Lab, some of the work that we're doing, and of course, continue to bring attention to these important questions around transportation and aging and engaging people in these conversations so that we can we can make uh, make the world and make life better for all of us who want to continue to uh, to age. Um, so I want to start by giving a little bit of an overview of what the age lab is for people who are not familiar with it. We are a, um, an industry, primarily industry sponsored lab here at the MIT Center for Transportation and Logistics. We're a multidisciplinary group that integrates research around human behavior, design, and technology, all with the goal of envisioning 100 good years of life across the lifespan. Um, we have really tried over the 25 years that we've been in existence to think about aging as an opportunity. It's not a challenge, it's not an issue, it's not a problem that needs to be solved, but really to see this as an opportunity for us as individuals, as families, as communities, as a society, to, to see this as, as a new frontier for innovation and, and doing things differently. We're really a very applied lab. We'd like to do research that can be translated to the real world and really make a difference in the lives of real people. We are also a multidisciplinary lab. And so though we sit within the Center for Transportation and Logistics, as you'll see, our research encompasses transportation but goes beyond it. And as such, it really reflects the range of different people and backgrounds that we bring to the work that we do. So everything from engineers, um, from operations research to urban planning, social psychology. I myself am trained as a political scientist. Uh, my boss is a political scientist, so we're interested in policy. We're interested in terms of how people are, are thinking about things um, and accepting new ideas. So we really run the gamut in terms of disciplines. And I think that also makes our research and the kinds of questions that we ask better. 
So as I mentioned, we span more than just transportation research here at the Age Lab, although that's where our work started and I will be focusing primarily on some of our research around transportation. Um, so we do work in transportation livable communities, but we also have three other pillars of work around caregiving and well-being, uh, retirement and planning for longevity, and home logistics and services. So thinking about new technologies and the migration of all of these technologies to the home. We have a number of different research outputs. We have hundreds of academic articles, conference presentations, publications. We have several books, as you see here. Um, we have a new book coming out in the fall called Longevity Hubs, which is about thinking about whether there are geographic opportunities around businesses and individuals coming together to think around innovating, um, innovating economically to, so, to meet the needs of an aging population better. So I want to talk a little bit more about some of the research methods and tools that we have here at the lab. And I'll, I'll mention these in conjunction with some of the different kinds of research projects that we have. So if you look on the, on the left side, we've got our Miss Daisy driving simulator as well as a, an on-road vehicle. Um, so I mentioned our work started in transportation. When I started at the lab, um, some of the original work that we did was around how you help families have conversations about driving as they're getting older. Are they safe to continue driving? How can you have more effective and constructive conversations around keeping older adults mobile if you need to take driving out of the equation? Um, so that work has continued and that's the kind of work and the social science work that I continue to do in the transportation space as well as some of the other research that we do. Others of my colleagues have gone on to really focus more on the transportation piece, I'm sorry, on the technology piece around transportation. So more specifically thinking about um, how do drivers divide their attention when they're engaged in the driving task? How do they engage with new technologies in the vehicle as we have these, these more autonomous and, and driver support systems moving to cars in the fleet today? How are drivers actually using them? How do we design systems to be safer? So we use our driving simulator to answer some of those questions, but a lot of the work that my colleagues in this um, advanced vehicle technology work, or our ABT consortium are doing, are really around collecting a, a huge naturalistic data set um, around drivers engaging with these systems. So we have a series of vehicles that we own and that we basically check out to people who are research participants for like a month or so and they'll drive them and we'll collect all of their data to understand better, more about their driving experience. Um, so we've obviously, so that's, we've, we've got that going on in transportation. We use a lot of uh, social science research methods for our work in transportation across and in other fields. So surveys, focus groups, interviews, in the middle of this screen, you'll see a Zoom window, which encompasses our lifestyle leaders panel. We have a couple of different unique panels at the Age Lab, and I'll be referring to some research that we've done with these groups as I go through. Um, one of them is our lifestyle leaders, and this is comprised of people who are all ages 85 and older. Prior to the pandemic, we had them coming to the lab to take part in research. And since the pandemic, we have been primarily online, um, but this group comes together once every other month. We have them fill out a, a pre-group questionnaire. They come, we have a, usually a brief research presentation, and then we engage essentially in, in small group and focus group discussions with our lifestyle leaders. We also use them as a test bed and um, various kinds of uh, research participants for other work that we have ongoing. And finally, all the way on the right side of the screen, you'll see who's probably one of our most famous Age Lab members, which is Agnes, who, which stands for our Age Gain Now Empathy System Suit. This is a suit of off, basically off-the-shelf materials that we've assembled together to give people an opportunity to experience what it might be like to walk through the world as an older adult might experience it. So it's not certainly... Um, you know, we don't we don't pin it to a particular age, um, but we have looked at physically does this you know does it does it change people's movements and functionality in ways that are consistent with what we know about aging? We know that to be true. We've got some ongoing research with Agnes um, still to try to understand better what's the effect of wearing the suit. 
but we use it often with engineers and designers who are developing new technologies and products so that they can get a sense for how have I done in terms of designing this? Can I do better? How might an older adult experience this environment or this context or this device? As well as a storytelling tool as we think about our own longevity and living longer. How do we think about the environments that we're living in? So if anybody has, as one of my colleagues likes to say, a subscription to Disney Plus or borrowing one, um, we have limitless Chris, Chris Hemsworth's Limitless series with National Geographic and Disney includes a whole episode devoted to him wearing a specially designed Agnes suit and essentially living in an older adult community to get a sense for what his life might be like as he ages. So again, we rely on a really wide range of tools. We draw on a number of different disciplines. We really bring a whole range of ideas and tools into the mix for the work that we do. So I'm gonna talk a little bit um, today about aging as a success story and why we wanna focus on transportation and, and why it has really remained a challenge for us. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, we started, the lab started in trans with transportation with my boss, uh, Dr. Joe Coughlin's recognition that we had this growing older population who were really, very dependent on cars for getting around and yet we didn't have an infrastructure or technologies that were designed to accommodate them. Um, so that was kind of where we dug in and where we had our, as a research group's entry into aging. Um, and I'm here to report that 25, 25 years later, we still, we, it's still a challenge. It's not, not an easy problem to solve. But to go back, one thing that, that we have gotten really good at is helping people live longer. Aging is a success story. And you can see that when you look at things like life expectancy by generation in the in the U.S. And you can see that, you know, from people who were born at the you know the early 20th century versus people born mid-century and later, we've really seen these tremendous gains in life expectancy. And obviously, a lot of this has to do with all of the advances in public health, in medicine, education, technology that have enabled us to live longer. Um, but if, if you think about what are some of the, the greatest innovations and the most dramatic um, changes in how we live, you know, this is really one of them. If you think for the hundreds, the thousands of years prior to the 20th century, um, humans simply did not live on average very long. And two within the past, within the past 150 years to have experienced these incredible gains in life expectancy. You know, in some ways, we weren't really evolved to live this long. So we really were really playing catch up to some degree um, for these really dramatic in increases in life expectancy. So again, we here at the Age Lab see this as this is an opportunity. This is the longevity bonus, these extra years that we have we have earned and, and learned to uh, to give to ourselves. But that life expectancy <clears throat> also means that in addition to us individually having to plan for longer lives, it means collectively and societally how societies have been organized in the past and what that age structure has looked like have changed as well. So it used to be that you know the, the traditional population pyramid had many more younger, younger people, younger adults compared to fewer and fewer older adults as you went up in the age pyramid. But with the increases in life expectancy, what we see are kind of the squaring, what's called the squaring of that pyramid, where we have relatively fewer children and younger adults compared to a growing population of older adults because we're living longer. And you see that in the relative increases in the population of older adults. And frankly, one of the reasons why we focus on the lifestyle leaders and, and set that um, you know, that, that lower limit for joining that panel at age 85 is 85 plus is the fastest growing segment of the U.S. population. And in fact, if you look at 100 and plus, that's the fastest growing segment of the population. Um, so really, we have some very, you know, we've got some dramatic shifts going on from, from the societal level as a whole, which, which you know, as we're going to be talking about transportation means that we have some challenges around how we can accomplish um, some things like maintaining mobility for this aging population. Um, so what this also means, though, as we think about longer lives, changes in the, the overall structure of the population, 
Um, you know, we've also had these real um, changes in how we're living our lives as well with the advent of, of technology into our daily lives with, again, improvements in medicine, education, public health. We have new expectations for what our quality of life will be as we age. Um, and this is a quote that I have up on the screen from my boss in, in his book, The Longevity Economy. So we're stuck with the notion of oldness that is so utterly at odds with reality that it's become dangerous. It constrains what we can do as we age, which is deeply troubling, considering that the future of our older world will hinge on the actions of the older people in it. So one of the things that we have really strive to do at the age lab in in our time here too has really to been been to to try to change people's notions and stereotypes around what what older who older adults are what their needs are and what their expectations are um and i will say that i feel like in the past five to ten years societally we've gotten better at acknowledging oh you know what there are many more older adults and it turns out as you age um, it's, you know, our expectations, our stereotypes don't immediately go to someone who's sitting at home in front of the television, not really engaged with the world outside the, uh, outside of outside of their home. But again, we have these new expectations of, well, it means that I'm traveling. It means that I finally have the time to kind of do the work that I want to do and engage in, in the kinds of activities or volunteer, volunteer work that I always wanted to do but didn't have time to. Um, but it also means that we might have new expectations for what our health will be like, that if your knee is starting to hurt or your hip is starting to hurt, that we're not accepting that as, oh, this is just aging, can't do anything about it, but that we're really looking to, for example, healthcare, healthcare spaces to, to help us solve these problems, that we're not just kind of willing to sit back and, and for example, some previous generations might have just said, yeah, that's just what happens as you get older. There's not much more you can do about it, but we have... As, you know, as younger generations, as the baby boomers have gotten older, as Gen X behind them is getting older, as millennials are even starting to get older now, um, new expectations for what we expect our older life to be and how we plan to live as older adults. So aging is happening everywhere, but it's uneven. And this is true globally as well. If you look at, you know, aging is happening across the globe, um, not just in the U.S., not just in developed countries, um, but some parts of the world are aging more rapidly than others. And what we see in the U.S., if we focus on where are some of those uneven areas of aging, it's that older adults are more likely than the general population to live in rural areas. So 24% of people 65 and older live in rural areas today compared to 20% for the whole population. Um, and this graph is a little bit dated looking at, at um, you know, census data from 2012 to 2016, but you can see you know, with the green, green, green spikes that indicate rural population, you can see that sort of once you hit age 45-ish, you start to see a little bit more of, of a shadow of the green, um, indicating that there are there's a greater percentage of people in those age groups living in rural areas compared to urban areas. Um, having said that, still there are more older people living in urban areas, but disproportionately um, there's more representation in rural areas. And if you drill down a little bit further and you look at, you break this down by age, you can see that in some ways we have um, younger older adults slightly more likely to live in rural areas compared to older, older adults. So the 85 plus, um, the percentage of people in those age groups who are living in rural areas is lower compared to people in that 65 to 84 year old, kind of that young old stage. Um, so people who might uh, might just have retired, maybe maybe there's some relocation, or people who aged in place and are still living in the community that they lived in all their lives, but potentially, you know, more out migration and that older old stage of 85 plus perhaps to places where they can be better, you know, where there are healthcare facilities, for example, that are, they have better access to or um, senior housing communities that, again, um, provide better access to, to healthcare services and other services that people in that age group may need. Um, 
But I think one of the general questions, and I don't think this is going to come as a surprise to anybody who's listening to this, is you know this general question of what what difference does it make if older adults are more concentrated in rural versus urban communities? And obviously, this is a big question around equity and quality of life. Um, the question is, if you're living in a rural community, which has many advantages and many wonderful things about it, um, there still might be more challenges around accessing what people might need in order to live well. So thinking about healthcare services, thinking about um, how you're maintaining social connections and, and those kinds of outings, um, physical, physical well-being and activity levels. What about other needed goods and services? So I think that as we're thinking about um, as we're thinking about this this question in general, and we're thinking about um, rural communities, we want to think about you know how can we ensure that residents, older residents in particular, in these communities are able to access and and benefit from um, you know all of the the longer years that we have. So why focus on transportation in particular as we're thinking about aging in rural environments in particular? Um, so transportation is quite simply the glue that holds our lives together, right? Without transportation, you can't get where you want to go to do the things you wanna do, see the people you wanna see, um, access work, medical appointments, shopping, socializing. Transportation is instrumental and key to enabling us to be able to do any of those things. Um, and as I mentioned, this isn't an issue that we have been able to solve. And, and we might think that in some ways it's been a longer term issue in rural communities than it has been in urban ones where we've been able, you know, where we have the density, for example, to better support public, kind, public transportation kinds of options. Um, but I think we also want to think too, you know, how are rural communities changing as well in this in these you know past several decades, and thinking about how that intersects too with the transportation needs. So we'll continue to talk about this, and I'm sure that the panel after this will touch on these questions. So thinking about transportation and driving in the U.S. generally. What we know is that people of all ages are most likely to use and prefer to use personal vehicles as their primary mode of transportation. We love to drive in the US. It's our, it's our, it's the way that most of us get around. Um, and you know, it's some uh, looking at data among older adults, people 65 and older, um, you know, 70% of older adults trips were as drivers themselves. And then 20% of the remainder were as passengers in a private vehicle. And we know that older adults today drive more than in previous generations. We also know from our research that older drivers generally make good decisions about when and where to drive safely as they age. In short, they self-regulate. They cut back on driving at times that are more stressful. They tend to drive, you know, tend to um, do more planning around trips, for example, being later in the morning or early afternoon to avoid peak travel times. They'll avoid poor weather, um, you know, again, avoid dusk and dawn driving where light can be a little trickier. So what we've seen from our research 20 plus years ago through now is that older adults are really self-regulating their driving in ways to keep themselves safer and on the road. We've also seen some of this kind of self-regulation around technology in vehicles. So when we ask older drivers about, are you engaging with different kinds of distracted driving behaviors? Are you eating or drinking? Are you listening to the radio? Are you talking on a cell phone? Um, what we've seen in some of um, some data that we analyzed pretty recently were that older adults tended to cut back on those kinds of distractions to be able to focus better on the driving task. So. Older, older drivers have more experience, but we also see that they they think a lot about the they think more about the context in which they're driving, and uh, and we attribute this in around older drivers wanting to continue to drive safely. But in lower density rural areas, when we think of too about alternatives to driving, there are simply fewer public alternatives. So, personal vehicles and driving are, you know, even it reinforces further 
the need for driving oneself or having an available driver in order to be able to get around, in order to be able to live the kinds of lives that people want to and are accustomed to. So driving, again, is instrumental. It's a primary primary mode, but it's also not simply a means to an end. Um, what we know, too, again, from research is that driving is also a symbol. It represents autonomy and freedom, agency. And as we age, often we are giving up pieces of our autonomy. And, and driving is one of those cases where people, people feel very strongly about, again, wanting to be able to um, maintain their ability to go where they want, when they want. Uh, and the ice cream cone is emblematic of that. Many years ago in the Boston Globe, an older woman wrote a piece, an op-ed piece about why she didn't want to give up driving is because when she wanted to get an ice cream cone at 7.30 on a summer evening, spontaneously, she didn't want to have to have planned for that trip weeks in advance or hours in advance or depend on somebody else to come and do something. Instead, she wanted to just be able to go in her car and get it when she wanted it. So that notion of having the freedom to do what you want when you want to um, is, is kind of encapsulated in that. And I will say we've heard some other kind of less wonderful things in focus groups. Um, so somebody saying, literally, um, you know, I don't want to give up my driver's license. You know, you only have one driver's license, um, but you know, I, I would give up my wife because you can always get another wife. Or somebody saying, you know, if it came to eating steak or having soup every day, I would eat soup every day because I will not give up my car. So, so a lot of emotion, a lot of passion for many people around driving. And again, what it represents is that that sense of autonomy and that sense of freedom. What we also know is that having that, that freedom to kind of get up and go where you want, when you want, and being able to drive. Um, is associated with better health. And what we've seen is when drivers stop driving, that it, those, that driving cessation is associated with increased depression, declines in physical health, declines in out-of-home activities, and, and greater social isolation. And we know from some more recent work um, by Julianne holt Lundstad and her colleagues that social isolation is associated with worse physical health. Um, they've described... Um, Social isolation is the equivalent of smoking 15 packs, of, you know, 15 cigarettes a day. So it's not just that driving is about people getting out and doing things. It's also about their health. Um, there is some recent research that suggests that for some people, quality of life may improve after people stop driving. Um, but you know, this is relatively new research, and so I think we need to to look at, uh, you know, and I think that some of these. I think that some of the benefits may be more localized to people, for example, who have drivers in the universe and able to give them rides versus people who are struggling to access alternative modes. So we did some research with the lifestyle leaders pre-pandemic. We're actually about to repeat this research in May to, to talk to them about their, their transportation and mobility needs and satisfaction. Um, and we found out that people in our lifestyle leaders group who tend to be on average healthier and wealthier, again, tend to be a relatively urban group because they were local to MIT's campus here in Cambridge, um, you know, that they generally had pretty high degree of satisfaction and with their mobility. Um, but we did see that they had started to shift away from, from modes, from driving and walking modes toward more use of friends and family as a way to get around. Still, for many of them driving, but relying on others for rides. Um, I'm gonna show a slide in a second to talk a little bit more about some of the greater stress that they experience around transportation and making trips in general. But one way I think of thinking about this is transportation right now, we, we think about it in the back. For many of us, if we're, we're healthy and able and we have access to a good transportation mode, we don't really think about it. We just, we just kind of, it, it gets us where we need to go. We hop in the car, we take the walk, we hop on the bus. Um, but as we age, even for people in more, more transportation rich environments, transportation becomes more of a task and something to be managed in its own right. So it's not just incidental or instrumental, but something that we need to focus on. And we see this in our lifestyle leaders data, um, where we see that they have an, even in particular, a feeling of increased dependence on others 
more experience of physical fatigue associated with transportation and much more time spent around having to plan for transportation. So having to plan trips in advance, where you're going to go, when you're going to go, how you're going to go, who might take you there. So just again, more of these, more it becomes more of a, a burden and a task to, to plan to be able to go anywhere. And we see this too in, in some of our other data around caregiving. So we've, in addition to our lifestyle leaders panel, we have a panel of family caregivers um, who are providing typically unpaid care to another family member. So a spouse, an adult child, um, an adult parent or an older parent, excuse me. Um, and we asked recently about the different kinds of responsibilities that caregivers had. And we found out that transportation was actually the number one task that caregivers took on. It's probably one of the earliest tasks that caregivers take on, kind of a signal of some of the, the, the caregiving that might be to come for them. So 93% of current caregivers told us they were involved to, in some degree around their care recipients' transportation needs. Um, when we asked former caregivers, transportation was the number one task um, that they were involved in. And while we see when we ask caregivers, um, you know, while they did have some support, you know, nearly three out of four of them basically said, it's my care recipient and I who take care of transportation. So really only about one in four had some other kinds of, I'm sorry, um, yeah, I, I shouldn't, had some, more than that, um, like say four out of 10 had some other resources available in their environment. So another family member, um, friend or family or other kinds of resources that they could rely on to support with transportation. So what are some solutions that have been proposed over time to thinking about helping support transportation generally, as well as um, thinking about rural communities in particular? Um, so first is this notion of life on demand. So having it all, not owning anything available whenever, wherever you want it. Um, so these kinds of sharing economy services, having Amazon deliver everything to your door. So we we did some research with our lifestyle leaders, and again, this is this is data that are a little bit old, but we asked them about what are you using, why are why are you using it or not. So cost, trust, um, familiarity with being able to access some of these kinds of services through apps, issues around independence and control, and also um, thinking about how some of these outside activities help people structure their day, keep them engaged, um, help them help keep them physically fit. So again, when we think about you're going to the store to get groceries, but that's also a social interaction. So it's great, maybe we can have groceries delivered to you and maybe that solves one portion of the need, but it doesn't get you out of your house. It doesn't get you engaging with other people or seeing neighbors, friends um, in, in kind of incidental ways. So this, this notion of life on demand can maybe solve for some problems, but certainly not for all of them. And there still continue to be issues with access, um, especially around, again, in rural areas where there might not be the density to create the demand to be able to have these kinds of services at a level that really makes a difference for people. Another incomplete solution is around technology. Um, we've been waiting for the self-driving car to come you know, for decades, forever. Um, these vehicles aren't on the market yet. And my colleagues who study these technologies suggest that they're not coming anytime soon. Um, there's still a lot of work to be done so that these technologies, even the even the existing technologies that we have work more reliably and um, enable people to communicate and use the systems more safely and as intended. Um, and we have a lot of questions still around people's willingness to trust and use these technologies. And even in the case of self-driving cars, let's say you can order up a car or lift an Uber to come to your house. We have this, what we call the last 25 yard problem. If you're an older adult and maybe you're struggling with mobility, how do you get from inside your house to that vehicle? So some of these services, they don't solve for that. So we have to think again, kind of end to end as we're thinking about older adults and enabling them to do what they wanna do and to and access what they need. So transportation is a challenge still. And you know, we, we like hard problems um, and that's why we're still here and that's why we're still studying this. 
Um, but we, you know, we've spent 25 years thinking about transportation in different ways, and we, we don't have an easy solution for it. Even societally, politically, we don't have just a, a plug and go, here's the one solution, it's one size fits all. Um, so we need to still be thinking hard about transportation. What can we do? And so as a researcher, I'm going to say what we need, of course, is more research. Um, we need to think about older adults and families needs, how these might vary by context. Um, how do changing family structures, so we're thinking about changing demographics. You know, we've got changes in fertility, changes in number of children in households, changes in number of, a, of heads of households changing patterns of work if more people are working remotely. How does that intersect with people's demand for and access to transportation? How does this affect what more rural communities look like in the US as we have these changing family structures and work patterns reverberate? Um, as we think about rural and suburban contexts, what kinds, you know, we need more research to figure out what kinds of supports do families potentially need to support mobility again across a family system. Technological innovation still needs to happen. We still need to be thinking about how do we develop continuously safety technologies, vehicle designs to keep older drivers and passengers safe. How can we learn about better how we can teach and train people to use new transportation technologies to get them to accept them, to ensure that they are trustworthy, um, and then to use them in practice, hopefully to improve our mobility. Thinking about drivers and families, how do we support continued safe driving practices? So how do we engage people around having conversations regularly about driving and transportation, maybe not accepting that, that driving is something people will use for the whole of their lives, but getting to think about what does it mean to plan for transportation in our later years? Thinking too about how physical health is connected to driver fitness. So Sometimes we're not excited to eat healthily for, you know, because because our blood because of our blood pressure that we can't really see necessarily. But what if we could tell people that if you're if you're exercising and eating well and taking care of your health, it's going to help you extend your driving lifetime. That might be more motivating for people. And then how do we think about maybe drivers that is the new lifelong learning that we need to think maybe about continuously retraining and educating drivers throughout the lifespan, especially as transportation technologies change and emerge. If we think about new services emerging, that we need to teach people where they are, how to access them, or new vehicle technologies. How do you engage with them? How do you use them safely? But these are some opportunities to rethink how we think about, for example, driver's education. Obviously, if we think too about, especially in rural communities, we need continued support and development of re reliable high-speed internet access. If we think about all the technologies that, in, that will offer the potential for people to continue to age independently in their homes where they want to, we need to be able to offer, off, you know, give them the juice that they need to work. Um, if we think about vehicle technologies that rely on internet service. Again, if we want to be able, if we want to look for a future where these, where these technologies can support transportation and mobility needs in rural communities, we need to have this service. And obviously this, I'm, this is something that has been talked about for many years at all levels of, of our political system. But again, we need to continue to push to ensure that we have this access. We need to think about continuing to develop alternative transportation solutions and new services. So options like ITN America's America's Volunteer Driver Center, but how can we innovate around these spaces? And can we use maybe rural communities to serve as living labs to test different kinds of options? How can we use technology in other ways um, rather than just driving us someplace to, to help us leverage the existing resources that we have in the network? And then thinking more broadly as part about transportation as part of a larger healthy aging ecosystem. Um, thinking about, you know, what do we gain by reframing transportation and mobility as a public health issue? I don't think that we lose very much by reframing it that way, other than noting that, you know, it, transportation is a little bit different than, um, you know, just, you know, than, than sort of a blood pressure pill or um, it's a little different than, you know, clean water in some ways, but how do we ensure that um, 
that we, we connect the dots between transportation and health. And as we think about supporting healthy aging for a population, we're also thinking about supporting mobility. Um, so thank you so much. I really appreciate your time and attention today and I'm excited for the panel. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Lisa. That was wonderful. And I want to thank everybody who put their questions in Q&A. Lisa, I'm hoping you'd be willing to answer some of them in chat. I think you got too many of them, but I'll just pose one and then we can have more discussion uh, during, the pan uh, during, during the panel discussion. So Lila Ralston, I hope I pronounced that right, uh, asked this question. They said, my mother and I grew up in the same small Georgia town. When she was a child in the 1920s, she could ride a train to the nearest city to go shopping and ride home in an afternoon. When I was a teen, I could flag down a bus, but only one per day ran that route. Now there is no transit at all between those points. Is this reversible or are we irrevocably committed to cars? Ooh, that's a great question. Um... So I think that I would say first, we don't have great uptake even in urban centers where we have transportation alternatives of those alternatives. We still have, I, I think even in our ethos and our culture, a pretty strong preference for, for cars and private vehicles. Um, I don't think that's immutable. I think that that can be changed over time, but it really in, requires a degree of investment, I think, politically, financially, um, in making those services available. Um, you know, I, I'm in our community, for example, there's a lot of conversation around bike lanes and and thinking about what did Denmark look like 50 years ago? It turns out not everybody used to love to bike in Denmark, but once you built infrastructure and made that option more available and accessible for people over time, they they were able to, you know, they moved to it and they've used it. Um, I think that, you know, offering those kinds of transportation alternatives and options in less densely populated areas requires a, a not insignificant economic and financial investment. And I think there's a real question of whether we have the, the you know, to some degree, the, the resources, but more importantly, I think the will to provide that. And, um, I don't know that I don't know that I see that on the horizon. So I, I think we need to continue to push for some of those. I think we need to think about private public partnerships within the transport the broader transportation community and think about what other kinds of alternatives maybe can can come in to fill those kinds of spaces. Um, can we do that more creatively in ways that maybe don't involve, you know, don't require like, you know, building a train line or having a public bus running? Can we think about whether we can have more informal networks um, that are done that we're not really depending on a centralized government necessarily to provide. So I don't think that's that's a great that's that's the best answer, but I think that that's what I've got. I don't I don't see the the sun shining completely on that. Well that's an honest and a comprehensive answer. And I think it launches us very nicely into our panel discussion. And to do that, we would like you to take a quick poll with us. So Alicia should have a poll up in a minute. Great, there's the poll. And here's the question. If you're an older adult or work with older adults, has there been a time when transportation was a barrier to being able to meet your personal goals? So yes, often, yes, occasionally, not really, or no, I have easy access to transportation when and how it's needed. Let's see what those answers are. Alicia, maybe we take just another 30 seconds to see the results. All right, there they are. Well, and unfortunately this is I guess sort of what I was expecting, but you always want to be more optimistic. You see that majority of you, 47% that yes, often you have experienced barriers with transportation and another 37 said yes, occasionally. So that makes it 
almost three quarter who have some sort of a barrier with transportation was only 16% uh, indicating not really having any barriers or 8% saying that they have easy access to transportation where they live, which is wonderful. So with that, thank you for taking the time. I think it provides more context for our panelists too. I would like to hand it off to my colleague who leads our Center on Healthy Aging Innovation Special Interest Group that's specifically focused on transportation and aging, Dr. Laura Hammy. Dr. Laura Hammy is an assistant professor in the Department of Psychiatry and a clinical researcher at the Minneapolis Veterans Administration Geriatric Research Education and Clinical Center. It's a mouthful, right? Her work focuses on the assessment of cognitive and functional changes in later life with the focus on factors affecting driver safety and insight. So Laura, handing over to you. Hi, thank you so much. And thank you for the poll and the lovely talk. Um, yes, I know the abbreviation for where I work is the GREC. Some people sometimes have heard of those, but it is a mouthful. So um, we have a lovely panel for you today. And actually I'm gonna ask our panel to go ahead and um, turn on their camera so that we can see you all. And if it's all right with you, I'm gonna ask the panel to introduce themselves. Um, they really had some great introductions previously and I know that you're all gonna to wanna to hear from them and their own words about what got them interested in this field and what they're doing now. So um, it would be ideal if you could each say a little bit about um, what brought you to the work in transportation, how you came there and where, where are you working now? What is your organization that you represent? Um, and maybe a little bit about how that organization and what you're doing is helping to try to address um, our first poll. So the idea of transportation maybe as a barrier to life goals. Um, perhaps we could start with Michelle, Michelle Dig from the Minnesota Department Office of Trans uh, Transit and Active Transportation. Thank you. Hi, hello everyone. I'm Michelle Lichtig and I'm with the Minnesota Department of Transportation and I'm a program manager and I have oversight of the mobility management program. Thinking about how did I get to the work that I am doing now is I'd like to say I was sat across the table from a lot of older adults when I was working in the new area at that point of home and community-based services. So if we go to the way back of 25 years ago, we were looking at how can we rebalance funding that we were uh, looking at aging in nursing homes and transforming that to aging in the community, in home and community-based types of services and supports. So on many states and, and on a federal level, we wanted to shift the funding sources into the home and community so that people could age in places and environments that they chose. So it's through that experience that I worked with a number of nonprofits that I began in the home and community-based uh, uh, realm. And with that, obviously, transportation came up to be an extensive issue to the point that uh, in, in the urban areas and in the rural areas, there are real and there are maybe perhaps imposed barriers that don't have to be there. Something called the county line. Can't get from here because one provider provides services here and your doctor, your medical appointment is over there. So that was sort of my first aha is how we could start looking at some of these barriers to transportation. From there, I've been able to work in public health programs. So I really appreciated the conversation about how some of the work that, that transportation should be considered as a, an important connection to public health, because indeed it, there, there is a significant connection to that. To further work that I've had in, within state government, working with a statewide um, program that provided grants to about 90 organizations that provided home and community-based services, most of them in rural Minnesota. And it gave me a great insight, both into rural transportation volunteer programs and other types of programs that help keep people uh, remain in their homes. So today, what I'm doing is I work in the very wonderful and interesting world of mobility management. And so what is mobility management? Well. It's as it's defined by the National Center of Mobility Management, 
it is an approach to designing and delivering transportation services that starts and ends with the customer. That means that individual and the community. It begins with the community vision with strong community organization in which the entire transportation health network, uh, um, volunteers, planners, stakeholders, area agencies on aging, services that support uh, people with disabilities come together and have conversations about what are the barriers and what are the potential solutions. Currently, I coordinate a dynamic network in Greater Minnesota of mobility managers. And so in the state of Minnesota, we decided that uh, some of the solutions were going to come perhaps in a very local regional way that could maybe be shared with other regions. And so using some federal transportation funds, state funds and subrecipient matches, uh, we are working in a regional areas where we have mobility managers in seven different regions in our state. So what are, what are we really looking at? And so if I could just maybe close out my comments with giving you three visuals. The challenge that we're facing in rural Minnesota and in other ways is if you think about a, a lollipop, and I'll have to uh, um, share this thought with you because this is something that, that came from our state demographer. So um, I appreciate that. So a lollipop has a great big uh, candy part on the top, big round, and it's supported by a thin stick. Well, if we think about the lollipop part is the population that we're trying to serve and the stick is the resources. And that's really the visual reality of what we have in rural Minnesota. So what's the best way to leverage and use what we have in that stick? Because we're not gonna see that stick grow much further, but there are some nuggets in which we can get in and see if there's a better way that, that we can do that. So how do we go about that? Well, here's the second image that I'd like to share with you. Minnesota's part of the prairie. And in the prairie, a prairie grass, for every inch that's above the ground, there's one foot below the ground, and that's the roots. And that the roots that we look at is in each region, we are beginning to have conversations, dynamic conversations, exchanging ideas, thinking about what we can test among the community stakeholders, bringing together people who haven't necessarily coalesced or talked about transportation before. But unless we dig deep, and sometimes it may take a year or two or three to build that rooted structure, we will not see any solutions, which is what we start seeing once we have the deep roots. And so what is the issue? that we're trying to address and who are we trying to help? Well, again, my final visual for to share with all of you is if we think of a bell curve, that middle part of the bell curve, and we saw in some of the um, presentation earlier, that that may be taken care of. People are getting rides from caregivers or they're able to still access their own car. That middle part of the bell curve, that's being served pretty okay. But what we're looking at in mobility management is looking at the very ends of the bell curve. Now that isn't necessarily a great number of people, but it's individuals with the greatest need, which takes tremendous amount of creativity to meet that. Because in mobility management, we are charged with transportation access. We don't get to pick and choose that easy middle part. We are really focused on the ends. So what are some of the solutions that our mobility managers and mobility management projects have been able to come up with? I really like the comment that um, uh, the rural testing lab, uh, the incubator, each of our regional, uh, our, our regional mobility management projects is indeed an incubator. And how they approach a problem may be the perfect solution for their community, which can be shared with another one, or it may just reflect their particular community. In part, it may be an electric vehicle circulator, which is being discussed in one community. Or it may be at this point, digging in deep and building the roots of one mobility management project into trying to figure out how to have dialysis transportation when it's needed 
in an area that is now in critical situation because it's lost its transportation provider. Um, we have also dug deep into looking at volunteer driver and volunteer driver solutions to the point of proposing state legislation, which has addressed some significant barriers and that got passed to the point right now, and we can talk later, that we have some federal legislation that has been bipartisan support right now that we're hoping to get passed that will also support volunteer driver. But these are the things that bubble up from, from the community. And so why is it important? It's important to the individual as well. But likewise, what, we, what was presented to us earlier, it is important to our communities. Older adults are the economic force for many of these small communities. For a group of 10 older adults to be able to access the bank, the grocery store, um, the beauty shop, all those types of community services, it, it brings up and raises up that, that economic uh, vitality of the community. And also in my experience in the work that I have been doing, in uh, whether it's a nonprofit work or looking at uh, who are the leaders in our rural communities. They are our older adults and they are definitely the structure of which is the, the continuation um, and the web in which that vitality continues to grow. So with that, I'll uh, pause and um, welcome any opportunity to further talk about what mobility management is and indeed the incremental changes and responses that were actually being able to let older adults age in the community in the best way possible. Thank you for that. I really appreciate it. And you know, your last comments about drivers, I think help is a good segue. So our next panelist is Terry Smith. And would you care to introduce yourself from the um, Mid Minnesota Regional Transit Coordinating Council? Yes, thank you. Uh, my name is Terry Smith. Um, I'm almost 50. I'm a licensed mortician from the University of Minnesota uh, with a major in mortuary science. After graduating in 1997, funeral directors at that time were given the option to sign up as volunteers for a special uh, rural outstate eye tissue and whole globe procurement program and working with the university's Lions Eye Bank. And so I uh, signed up for that and, and did that for the next 15 years. When transporting the tissue uh, for the two hour drive to the university lab became inefficient, I coordinated with area Lions Clubs members as volunteer drivers to deliver the tissue that was later used for research and transplant. Uh, now, at my, as my current role as a mo mobility manager with the Regional Transportation Coordinating Council, I work with four counties in rural Minnesota to find solutions for those with transportation deficiencies, older adults, and people with disabilities. I also have uh, signed up as a volunteer driver with Central Community Transit. I now get the opportunity to meet with other volunteer drivers, uh, volunteer coordinators, and provide occasional rides for all types of people in need. I'm able to explore techniques to recruit other drivers and educate people on the benefits of helping others in this unique volunteer way to volunteer. Thank you. Thank you for that. Thank you for your service with the procurement project. Um, okay, so up next we have Kelly Ash. Would you care to introduce yourself? Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. Hi, everybody. I'm the senior researcher for the Center for Rural Policy and Development. We're a 501c3 nonprofit, nonpartisan organization, just focused on raising issues and doing policy analysis and other kind of data analysis uh, just for rural Minnesota. Uh, we typically just look at a lot of issues through a rural lens. And I would say always one of the bigger takeaways from our research is that things look a little different, solutions look a little different uh, in rural areas compared to metropolitan areas. And we're just kind of here to point some of that stuff out. 
And I would say over the last few years, a lot of our research has been around this just significant shift we're seeing. You know, we've been talking 20, 25 years that the baby boomer generation was going to retire. They're going to be a big, uh, large portion of our, our population. And here we are in 2020, and we're facing uh, just some of the issues that come along with such a large percentage of our population reaching retirement with also increasing uh, demands for healthcare services and things like that. And so a lot of our research is looking at not only what types of services uh, are going to be needed in rural areas and where the gaps might be, such as transportation or home-based healthcare, but also in the wake of these retirements, what are some of the issues such as labor force issues, right? We don't have enough people to fill the jobs that are needed in order to serve these populations. Um, transportation, uh, rural EMS is now kind of a big issue. Do we have enough people to serve and, and volunteer their time to be in EMS? Uh, and so uh, we also are seeing healthcare consolidations, uh, service consolidations away from our rural small towns to more metropolitan areas. And so what does that mean, again, towards transportation? And so a lot of the work we do is providing that context of like, look, this is a pretty dynamic, intense time of uh, our kind of society. And so this it's, it's both exciting, it's challenging, but there's tons of opportunities. And I think looking at rural uh, assets in order to solve some of our issues, just as Michelle was talking about in unique ways, uh, is going to make a big difference. So thanks for having me on the panel. I hope I can contribute into all the kind of context around this issue. Yeah, thank you. So our last uh, panelist is Anjali Cameron, who represents the Met Council District 8. Do you care to introduce yourself? Yeah, thank you so much. Um, it's an honor to be a part of this panel discussion and to bring up this really important issue of transportation, transit, and aging. Um, so I wear a couple of different hats um, and at, really at the intersection of all three of these issues. And so um, the first is that I am a member of the Minnesota Board on Aging, which oversees uh, um, Minnesota's Older American Act dollars um, coming into the state and the work of the area agencies on aging. I'm also the CEO of SEVA AIFW, that's Minnesota's largest South Asian serving nonprofit. And a major core component of the work that we do is serving South Asian immigrants and refugees, including seniors who um, have either made their lives in the U.S. and are retiring for uh, post-careers, as we might expect a lot of uh, seniors um, within the communities to age into a retirement population. But then we also serve a lot of seniors who are dependents on children, you know, in terms of their immigration or refugee status, that they are, they have arrived as dependents. And so that's really important in terms of how we provide those services and what is available to them in terms of transportation and transit access. Um, and finally, as you mentioned, Laura, I sit on the Metropolitan Council representing District 8. And so those are the districts between, um, uh, from those districts include Edina, St. Louis Park, Golden Valley, um, New Hope, Crystal, Robbinsdale, Hopkins, and uh, Brooklyn Center. And uh, I do want to mention that we are a regional body. So um, not only do I represent those communities, but we have a regional mindset for the Twin Cities metro area. So we represent the seven county Twin Cities metro area as a body, and that includes 181 communities of urban, suburban, and rural density. And that's really important. We have 40 townships within those communities. Um, and what we are seeing consistently across communities is that we have, as, as has been mentioned by the other panelists and our presenter, that the population is growing. Right now, one-seventh of the metro area population is um, of our region's residents are over the age of 65. And in some communities, there's at least 20% uh, of the population. So for 51 of our cities and townships, that population is over 20% of those communities are uh, made up of older adults. Um, we have, uh, you know, in terms of the responsibilities of the Met Council, we also think about planning in local communities and knowing that um, of those older adults, only um, uh, about 90% have a vehicle at home, but it, uh, about 8.5% do not have access to a vehicle at home. 30% identify as having a disability. Um, and while most older adults are still 
you know, driving is the main mode of transportation. Um, they uh, do make up uh, an increased proportion of the population that is using Met Council transportation services. And the biggest and one that uh, those of you who are in the metro area are familiar with is, of course, our metro transit services. So that's uh, primarily the fast, frequent bus all day services. We also have a couple of different lines, including arterial BRTs, as well as um, the light rail system. And then we partner with uh, some contracted services. So included in that is Metro Mobility uh, for those who qualify um, under uh, certain ADA guidelines, as well as non-ADA guidelines, depending on uh, where you are located within the seven, met uh, seven county metro area. And then we also have um, some additional services. So we have micro transit that we are piloting out in several areas. We have our uh, on-demand dial-a-ride if you, do, if you do not have access to um, fast, frequent, all-day service, uh, then we have some dial-a-ride dial -ride options. That's known as our transit link program. And so we have a whole portfolio of different modes of transportation depending on which community you live in and your specific needs. And so, um, but it is really important to recognize that as uh, as the demographic shift within our state, that all of these um, all of these transportation needs are shifting, both um, as our population, uh, as we talk about having a significantly um, heavier end of the curve that is um, part of our senior population, but then also thinking about the demographic shifts of immigrant and refugee communities growing within the state of Minnesota. And what does that look like in terms of um, how we are thinking about transportation for the next 20 to 30 years? Yeah, thank you. And maybe we should jump right into that. I know that several of you um, have interest and expertise in this area, how we think about issues around urban and rural and intersectionality and the shifts in age and where our population is coming from, and how that transportation is trying to meet the various needs of um, those people, where they are, and how it's changing by location. I know that, Anjali, you just spoke. I know, Kelly, you've also mentioned before about how um, the nature of the senior population or older adult population in rural areas is changing and their needs are somewhat different than what maybe sometimes one expects. Yeah, so, <clears throat> excuse me, I, I think it's interesting because uh, uh, if you look at rural Minnesota in general, right, it's going to be very different. So uh, we had Lisa talk a lot, uh, uh, our previous speaker talk a lot about kind of the national statistics, uh, looking at some of the data. <clears throat> and what's interesting, I think, is if you look at things locally, right, the data can tell you so much, but it's not going to tell us some of the granular detail. And this is where I really think like the area agencies on aging, um, our public health organizations, are, are, and even our healthcare institutions themselves are going to become extremely critical in terms of really identifying one, what, what, are, what is the demand? So we can look at a population chart and it will show, <laughs> puts up a thumbs up, isn't that nice? Um, we uh, we can look at a chart, like let's say uh, here, I live in New London, Minnesota, uh, in Candy, Ohio County. Bethesda has put up a couple uh, buildings here uh, that has multi-services in terms of, or multi, uh, like a, a large variety of services offered in this institution, right? So you can have independent living for seniors as well as assisted living all the way down to memory care unit, units, really interesting things. So if I were to pull up New London, I'd be like, oh man, they have a huge percentage of their population that's 65 and older. I bet the demand is high there. But yet Bethesda is providing a lot of the services, right? But if I were to go maybe a couple towns over, similar size population, maybe not as many concentrated aging population, but they don't have a Bethesda. They don't have anything. They're all living independently in their homes. Those services are going to look a little bit different. The demand actually might be higher. And so that's why I think like, you know, we've talked a long time about the statewide statistics, even regional statistics. Really now it's up to our local 
uh, organizations to really start filling in uh, some of this data and this information. And that's why I'm still late. I push pretty hard that we need more funding for our AAAs, our area agencies on aging as they are severely underfunded. Public health needs more funding. Uh, we need these organizations to have the resources to start really mapping out an inventory of the services that are available, who needs these services and what the gaps are. That's really where we're at, I think, even from a research perspective. Yeah, and um, and I, I'd like to um, add to that. Um, um, the area agencies and agents are, are critical partners. And uh, one of the things that in the work that we do in mobility management is that um, all of the regional mobility managers have uh, brought together what what are the resources in our community that's never been done before. So um, there's there's a resource guide that is available and um and later on we'll sh we'll show you how you can access some of this we we have some um links uh towards the end and so that that's a critical part about the work that they do because that that hasn't been done before um who's doing what and this just isn't uh, uh generally the formal type of transportation it may be some of the informal it's not necessarily transit so um in that light too we talk about when people um sort of this lifelong of a need for mobility, but all of a sudden we can no longer use a car. Well, you've never used anything but your car to get from point A to B. One of the strengths of the work that in, that is happening in mobility management is travel training. Um, how, what if you needed to use a volunteer driver program? How would that work? What type of information do you need to do that? What if you're in a rural area and you wanna um, start using the transit? How does it work to get on a bus? So travel training is a significant part about trying to make that transition and um, understanding the services that are there. But likewise, the data the, um, that we look at and the combination of looking at the gaps, there's nothing more tangible than when a mobility manager comes upon a pro, uh, an issue that really may affect two or three people. And they have to drive that solution. And we had that um, with uh, between Anoka County, which is sort of the edge of our urban area, and uh, a connection that needed to be made into uh, St. Cloud. Um, it was an older adult who needed to get to work and how is this going to work and so on and so forth. So it required the mobility managers from those two different regions to figure out, well, what's the transportation that is there? And how can we make it better for just this one person um, so that they can get to work? And so there were conversations. What could we change um, where the transit pickup is located? Would that help? And, and indeed, it was that type of solution that we were able to come upon. But with every solution that helps one person, we know that it impacts others. So although that solution served that one individual, it we also found in the end it served others. Yeah, thanks for that insight. You know, speaking about the driver programs, Terry, what can you tell us about the sustainability of volunteer drivers? Yeah, definitely. Um, you know, part of uh, my role as mobility manager is to seek out those options and also test piloting for myself, uh, being one of the youngest volunteer drivers. As Lisa had mentioned, that generation is a great part of the sustainability, um, where as uh, interviewing and speaking with other volunteer drivers and uh, especially digging into that baby boomer generation who's now that nearly uh, newly retired and has maybe some of that free time and opportunity but in in giving about 25 elevator speeches I have to try and convince folks to just give it a try. I often hear, oh, my parents used to volunteer drive. They did it for 20 years. Well, then that uh, quickly shifts to, well, is now you're at their age when they started. Are you going to give that a try? And uh, quickly see that uh, pivot of, well, it's not really for me or or whatnot. But those that do take that opportunity can see that uh, 
uh, benefit. And by benefits, uh, also was talked about that social, uh, social isolation, uh, ways that folks can actually uh, get out into the community and try something new or meet new people that they may have never encountered. Um, so looking at those key things as sustainability, uh, why uh, folks can drive. Um, I, I often give presentations at a mature driver discount course. This is kind of that insurance discount uh, class, which is a great uh, venue to meet uh, that safety conscious ideology that Lisa had also talked about. These uh, are potential volunteer drivers. However, um, they are looking at that uh, safety component because they're there. These are in-person courses. They could choose to take it online, but they're actually showing up to the table and uh, getting that one-on-one -on -one, uh, social engagement with others that are attending the class. And so that, again, is a target audience to uh, talk about the, the volunteer driving and, and these uh, conversations. Uh, one such driver, a 75-year-old gentleman who had a car dealership, who actually, uh, prior to retiring and selling his, his dealership, he held on to this perfect mint condition minivan that he had. And it was his goal to uh, use this van to provide church trips and volunteer and drive uh, within that. And then hence the pandemic came and he never got around to use it. When he actually heard my presentation, he said, this is what I've been looking for. I've got the vehicle, I'm ready to go. The next day he uh, signed up with Central Community Transit and uh, was out uh, providing rides and actually preferred the longer trip distance out here in uh, our rural area uh, to our, since our healthcare systems have pivoted uh, for specialty care. Uh, oftentimes folks need to uh, get a ride or, or drive an hour to that healthcare. Uh, and so those are the trips that he he chose to have. And so they're out there. It takes a while uh, to to find them uh, and turn those stones over. Um, but uh, I think resources to help us identify. There's real no uh, playbook on how to recruit these. It changes from community to community and the different types of people uh, that you really have to have that sales pitch in order to. Uh, get them to give it a try. Yeah, and if I <clears throat> could just jump on that too, Terry. I know in the Q and A's, uh, this uh, Jethra Cap asked, "Is there any any anybody that explored recruiting young volunteer drivers uh, for situations like this?" And as Terry was saying, that's typically what we see is that a lot of these organizations that are starting these volunteer dr driver programs, there isn't a manual that they can pull up and how to build this and how to recruit for. Right? These are all new things. One of the interesting parts about volunteerism, particularly of research that we've seen from the University of Minnesota Extension here in rural Minnesota, is that volunteerism, you know, everybody talks about nobody wants to volunteer these days. I can't find anyone. And that, that's absolutely not true. Actually, volunteerism is through the roof, but the competition to volunteer for things is through the roof as well. So K through 12 education demands a lot of different volunteerism from the parents. Um, college, everybody's volunteering for things, right? Like it's just every level, faith organizations, civic organizations, even recreational organizations are asking for volunteers. And so your, convert, your question about whether we can recruit young people, I think, is a good one, and it's an interesting one, and it's absolutely worth exploring. But I also think the it's a bit of an uphill battle because a lot of our high school students already are capped out on volunteering or being involved in things in order to fill out their experience and transcripts for applications for college. And that's typically what you run up to. And you even see this in rural EMS or ambulance volunteer drivers, right? They're just competing with a lot of other organizations that are volunteering. And this is what gets into the point. And Michelle, I know that you want to talk about this too, is you know, this is where policy can come into play, right? We have some local solutions here. Volunteer drivers is a good one. And as Michelle pointed out, we're kind of like, how do we help though that the people on the edge of that bell curve? Well, volunteer drivers were typically getting volunteers from the middle of that bell curve to help out the edge of the bell curve. It's typically what you see. So we have to put in some incentives, at least take away the barriers, even if we can't offer an incentive for the volunteers. And right now, I know there's a lot of conversation about reducing some of these barriers, but right now, you know, a lot of volunteer drivers, um, you know, the charitable uh, mileage reimbursement rate is 14 cents a mile. I think the business is, what is it, 64 cents a mile now, I think. Uh, 
And so a lot of organizations such as Terry's will be like, well, well, we can go ahead and reimburse you at the 64 cents, but only 14 cents of that is charitable. That means the rest of that reimbursement is going to be income. Well, if you're drawing from the middle of that bell curve and they're collecting social security and collecting income could hurt their benefits. And so again, you're kind of putting in these barriers that are in place. So just a real simple solution. And I think Michelle, you had mentioned this is being talked about at state and congressional level. Is that correct? Yeah. So, um, uh, what we were able to pass and, and uh, what we have a link to this um, is um, wasn't this this legislative session uh, one or two of them ago we were looking at the whole income tax subtraction uh, penalty so what Kelly uh, was uh, um, saying is that if as a volunteer driver you bring in a certain amount of income I think it's five hundred dollars or more you would be taxed so in Minnesota, we have been able to uh, work with our revenue department um, at that issue. And so we don't have that situation in Minnesota, but uh, that doesn't, uh, but there is a federal issue that's still part of it. So what we're proposing in the federal or what's being proposed in the federal legislation in just a broad brush is to um, have the opportunity for that um, reimbursement rate of 14 cents to go up to the business rate. And the reason why it has to go through the federal uh, uh, government and ha it has to be an act of Congress, because believe it or not, it was an act of Congress that put it at the 14 cents. So it was an act of Congress that said, well, the reimbursement is at 14 cents. The business rate and mileage rate is something that sits in the Federal Department of Revenue. And that isn't part of an act of Congress to change, right? It just changes within the Department of Revenue. So we'd like to have the mileage reimbursement for volunteers to be taken out of like a congressional direct control into the revenue, uh, the Federal Department of Revenue. So that's the legislation that's out there. And uh, it is the one thing that, uh, uh, and you'll see a link at the end, we would People say, well, what the heck can I do after this meeting? I would go to the Volunteer Driver Coalition link, look at it. Um, so we are on a national call. Look to see if in the updates, if your state, uh, 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 if your House of Representative or your senator is supporting this legislation. If not, uh, reach out to the, uh, to the coalition and we will try to engage that state uh, or that 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 type of uh, advocacy and support. That's great to know about. Thank you. Um, Anjali, I wanted to follow up with you. We've been talking a lot about driver services and there are a wider variety of services available sometimes in the urban and suburban areas. But I know that you with your various hats have contact with different groups and are you seeing patterns in what types of services people you know, meet their needs or which ones are willing to use, um, what we need more of, what we need less of? Yeah, so uh, first, I do want to just uh, touch on this point of volunteer driver services, and that is that as an organization at SEVA AIFW, we do chat, we always struggle with volunteer drivers, and we have tried a number of different options, including um, some intergenerational services, because as a cultural community, we have multi-generational supports are just built into all of our programming. One of the challenges is that uh, even as many people want to volunteer, that it is the time of day um, in which uh, transportation services are needed frequently. People need it during uh, daytime, weekday hours. And that's where we really struggle to find volunteers. Even today, I'm sending out three staff because one volunteer got sick and two um, are unavailable. And so we have to, you know, we have to be ready to accommodate that. And so that's where uh, transit systems come in is to be able to provide some of that fast, frequent all day service. And I think, um, you know, one of the things um, that uh, we have talked about in the past is around um, how important it is 
for uh, how the lack of reliable transportation ties into the social determinants of health. And these are all health equity issues as we're talking about aging and older adult populations. And one of the things that I want to highlight about that is that we typically think of transportation, you know, a lot of conversation has come up about medical appointments, but it's also where we see transportation services across metro transit and metro mobility services are all sorts of appointments. And one of the really important things that I want to highlight in this conversation is that in older adults, 20% within the metro region are employed right now. And so they're actually still going to work. And that is a big shift from previous generations. And so that's really important to recognize as we're talking about transportation services, that they're still part of the working population. And so having consistent transportation access and not one-time transportation is really important for a lot of elders uh, within, uh, across all communities. Um, I uh, really do, the other thing that I really wanna highlight in, in terms of um, the social determinants of health is the significant barriers that we see across multiple communities. And so I work with a community that is a community of color that is predominantly immigrant and refugee experienced. And so what that means for our seniors is that transportation access um, is a significant barrier. So I talked about some of the different subpopulations within the cultural communities that we serve at SEVA. And um, some, some of that population has never had access to a driver's license. And so we're not talking about someone who is aged out, but someone who has very limited mobility in terms of being able to get out and feel that sense of social connectedness. And uh, social isolation has been demonstrated to be more significant across uh, with racial and ethnic groups in terms of the disparities because there is language access. And the same is true for tra transportation access, that people of color experience more significant barriers in access to transportation. That's true across all three densities. So whether it's urban, suburban, or rural, and we do have a growing rural population of communities of color, and what that will look like long-term in terms of transportation support for those communities is a significant concern, I think, for the state. And many are having that conversation. But it is, uh, when we're talking about providing those transportation supports to communities, um, I think certainly at Metro Transit, um, at uh, Metro Mobility, we are very aware of the fact that the demographics of who makes up this community and what their needs are is shifting over time. And so we have programs like the Transit Assistance Program, which provides um, a subsidy to be able to support people who may need some additional um, uh, financial support to access transit programming. We also uh, I'm not going to remember who had said this earlier, but one of the really important things, I think it might have been Lisa, is that even transportation navigation can be really complex, whether you have been um, a resident of Minnesota your entire life or you are new to this country. Um, transportation is not always the most navigable system. And so we do have a service where you can actually, someone will help you, uh, you can call it Metro Transit and someone will help you plan out your route uh, help you even uh, drive on a route, and they do that for both, um, you know, single route service, or if you have a large group, let's say you have um, a group of people who all want to go to the same senior day program, how do you all access transit services there? So helping guide people, I think it's that one-on-one, -on -one, um, that one-on-one -on -one support as they're trying to navigate these services. And then you add on some of the cultural and lingu linguistic barriers we struggle as an organization to even be able to provide those transportation services um, to our clients because of how significant those barriers are. And we have not, um, you know, the best solution that we have found is just consistent. You know, we own our vehicles and are able to provide transportation services through SAF. That is the most consistent way we have been able to provide services where we have uh, staff that are speak the same language as the clients that we are serving that can build that social rapport with them. And so they have their drivers of preference and we try to accommodate that on our routes as much as possible. But it is, um, the barriers are significant when we're talking about mobility and cultural communities, Minnesota. Well, this has been wonderful. And I know that we're zeroing in on the end of our time. Um, 
maybe Tatiana can be looking for a particularly common question in the Q and A. And and while she does that, if any of you have um uh like a lasting comment or thought about what any of us as individual audience members can be doing to help improve access to transportation or help. I mean, I know there's already the comment about contacting your legislators, right? So any final words or comments you have for us to be activists in this area, please let us know. Laura, I just wanna comment, um, touching on something Michelle said, uh, Kelly said, and Angela just said, as we're thinking about you know, we've, we've been talking about transportation in different ways. It's important for health. It's important for equity. But I think also going back to, you know, there's an economic argument for why it's really important to keep people mobile as they age. So as Michelle was saying, you know, older adults are the, the economic engine. Um, these are where demand for services are going to come. But they're also where our labor is coming from. We need workers. We need older workers. We need older adults to stay in the workforce longer. And we know that there's also, you know, demand increasingly for um, workers in more rural communities. So, you know, as we're thinking about how do we keep not just our, our population healthy, how do we keep our economy vibrant? Um, you know, I think we need to, you know, we, we need to, as we're, we're making the argument for more transportation resources and devoting attention to how we keep people mobile, we need to proceed and make this argument on multiple different levels and fronts. I love that, Lisa, and thank you so much, everyone. Our amazing panelists, we really appreciate your time. And thank you all of you for joining us. We also want to thank the Center for Transportation Studies for co-sponsoring this event. As we've noted in chat, we will follow up with you with a list of resources, the recording and contact information for all of our speakers. You will also receive a satisfaction survey from us. We ask that you do fill it out if you can, as we are always looking for ways to improve how we deliver our webinars. But otherwise, thank you all so much. I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. Take care. Bye.